And good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world, or suspect it could, could be some good evenings as well. Uh, we're very excited to kick off the Sirius uh, Summer Security Series with longtime friend of Sirius, Dr. Gary McGraw. Gary is co-founder of the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning and recognized globally as a software security authority and has authored eight best-selling books on this topic. Gary produced the monthly Silver Bullet Security Podcast for IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine for 13 years, where he had the opportunity to host Sirius founder Gene Spaff Spafford. So we're happy for him to have to return the favor. Gary, welcome back to Purdue. We're excited about excited to hear you, excited to have you here and excited to hear your talk. Yeah, great to be here, Joel. So I understand that I apparently do this every 10 years or so. First talk was what, 2001? And then we'll pretend the other one was 2011, but it was really 2009. And now it's 2021. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll so get you, you on the book for 2031 right now. That sounds great. I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> well, so, do you want to tell us what the topic will be now, or do you want to let us know uh, later? Ooh, ah, <laughs> no. Yeah, no. You know, hand away the equivocation. How about that? <laughs> um, so shall I go ahead and start? It's yes, all yours. Thank you. Let me let me share my screen here. Doink. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, security engineering for machine learning, and there's kind of an important thing here, which is a lot of people are using machine learning to do security. So you have machine learning as say uh, an enhancement of a security feature, um, and uh, fewer people are doing what I'm doing, which is the security of machine learning. So my view is that if you can't secure your machine learning stuff, then why would you possibly use machine learning as a feature to enhance security? But all people don't, uh, you know, don't approach it the same way. Um, and then there's, there's further complication in the field because there's some people that use security um, they're machine learning for security, but they're really worried about the security of the thing that they're building. So they so they also end up doing security engineering for machine learning too. <laughs> um, but what I'm talking about, I call MLSEC. Some people call this adversarial machine learning. I'm not a big fan of that terminology, um, but they call it that anyway. And I will give you a little bit of a background. So Joel uh, mentioned a little bit. I've been doing um, computer security stuff since 1995. And I wrote one of the first books in the world on software security in 2001. I uh, had a company called Sigital that I ran up to about uh, 500 people with my colleagues. And we sold that to Synopsys in 2016. I worked for a public company for three years or two years, something like that. Oh yeah, two years. And then decided that having a boss is a bad idea. And I retired. And I'm super bad at retirement. I'm better at playing the violin or building big giant bonfires. Um, and what I decided to do intellectually on retirement was take a look at machine learning, because believe it or not, back in the old days when I was a grad student, I was very interested in machine learning and AI. I actually have a PhD in cognitive science and computer science from Indiana down in Bloomington. Um, and I studied with Doug Hofstetter. So part of what I did in grad school was build machine learning models using uh, connectionism and genetic algorithms and and other things and wrote a series of publications about that. But I really hadn't thought about machine learning for 25 years. And I was reading all the stuff in the press about how much kind of progress we'd made in the field. And you know, all the popular press, you never can tell if what you read is true. And, uh, and so I formed a reading group just to read through some of those papers and go look at the science and see what's actually happened out there. And what we very quickly determined about two years ago was that a ton of progress had been made in machine learning, but the progress was really um, due to unbelievable computer cycles that were available for super cheap and big giant reams of data that we didn't have before. And if you put those two things together with the algorithms we mostly knew about, um, even in the late 90s, late 80s and early 90s, when uh, Rummel Hart and McClellan were working on this stuff in PDP series, uh, most of the progress, you know, is accounted for by those, those big changes in hardware and data sets. Uh, and not much attention, some, but not much had been paid to 
the security issues surrounding machine learning itself. Um, so we started reading um, papers and thinking about that. And, and then we very quickly realized that some more work needed to be done in machine learning. So we, we founded an institute which is called the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning. Now, those of you in West Lafayette or are familiar with West Lafayette, you may think you guys are off the beaten path, but I live in a tiny little speck of a county and I my office is in uh, 10 miles away from the county seat and there are probably more cows than people in my county. So this is one of our logos and in the middle there is a shape that's actually the shape of my county, Clark County, Virginia, where the little West Virginia booger um, goes over the top of Virginia at the very, very top uh, and Berryville is, is somewhere in the middle of, of, uh, of, of that. And so the Berryville Institute of, the, of Machine Learning is what we've, we've been calling our little organization. Um, this is me and three other people. And the three other co-founders and I did a bunch of work and we wrote a, a risk analysis of machine learning systems, generically speaking, which I'm gonna talk about today. We identified 78 risks. And once we'd done that, uh, the open philanthropy people got in touch with us and they said, hey, you know, this is great work. We, we'd like to fund you guys. <laughs> Would you write something up and we'll give you some money? So we wrote six sentences and they gave us some money. And, and now I had to form it into a, a corporation. So Bimmel is actually a, a Virginia C Corp and I'm an employee of myself. Um, needless to say, another way of saying all this is that I really suck at retirement. Uh, but I am very interested in this space, something that we were doing for fun. And what I want to share with you today is the results of a couple of years worth of work. First, let's start with an introduction to machine learning to catch everybody up to speed, um, because the terms AI and machine learning and deep learning and all this stuff get thrown around kind of with impunity by the press as if they're equivalent. And they're really not. Um, we are never going to stop the press from doing what they do. But kind of here's, here's, here's a, a view that I stole from Melanie Mitchell, who wrote a fantastic book called Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. You can see the cover right there. And Melanie allowed me to steal her slides. So back in the 50s, um, when McCarthy and those guys were, were thinking about um, AI, there was a very famous um, meeting at Dartmouth. And a few white men got together and they decided they could solve AI. And I think it was a week or maybe two weeks. And it turned out they were way wrong. Um, but artificial intelligence really got its start in the 50s. Um, and, you know, machine learning was a little bit of a piece of that. There was something called perceptrons that was, uh, that came about by a guy named Rosenblatt early in the early days. And that's kind of, you know, you can think about that green square as perceptrons and maybe um, some aspects of Bayesian learning. Um, and then connectionism or deep learning was a little tiny subset of that all the way up through the 80s really when uh, the PDP books were published. So AI is this big thing. There's lots of stuff that happened in AI. There's lots of stuff still happening in symbolic AI and everywhere else that's not really machine learning. But this is what it looked like up until I went to grad school. Then around the early 1990s, it sort of turned into this because of PDP and the resurgence of connectionism. So we had AI and then machine learning was big, but still deep learning and you know multi-layer connectionist networks were pretty little. Nobody had invented convolution networks yet. And then in the 2010s, this happened. Now, um, when people talk about AI in the popular press, they really mean deep learning. So you get the terms AI and machine learning and deep learning all thrown around the same. Um, but basically what I'm talking about today, when I say machine learning security, I wanna address the problem of, um, of uh, multi-layer connections network. So deep learning uh, uh, kinds of things for machine learning. So that's kind of, you know, setting the stage for uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Of course, the, the whole idea behind these deep neural networks is to use the brain as a metaphor for how computation may occur. And the idea behind deep learning is, well, let's just look at something like the visual system in the human brain and let's figure out how that kind of sort of works. And then we'll build a model of that with artificial neurons and, and connections that are the same. Now, if you look at a real neuron and you look at say the synaptic calcium channel stuff and all of the chemical soup that that stuff floats in and the way um, you know, axons and neurons really work, 
Uh, what we're using today to count as a neuron is a very silly little model indeed. Um, but the important part, according to the deep learning people, is the number of connections between these neurons and the way thresholding works, and the fact that we can feed back through a network and adjust weights over millions of cycles, and in that way, um, change the statistical model that we're working on. So here we have the visual system of the brain. You have a picture of a dog and you know it goes into your retina and you got edge detection in your retina. Some simple shapes begin to get bi built up. Then you get into V1 through V4 and some more complex shapes get built up and it's sort of think about it as layers. And ultimately you have something that recognizes faces and objects in your brain. Um, and so the connectionists or the deep learning people said, well, let's just take inspiration from that and let's build conv convolutional neural networks that do the same thing, loosely speaking. So we've got a bunch of layers. We have an input layer where the raw pixels go or the process pixels go. Then we have a bunch of different layers and we feed up through those layers to the output. And at the output, we have a classification module um, that takes all of that, you know, activation that's come up through the network and it said, oh, that's 85% dog and 15% cat. Now, obviously that's not really the way people do it. You don't say, oh, that's 85% dog you got there. Very cute 85% dog. You just say dog. Um, and so it's important to realize that when people say understand or they say natural language processing or they say any number of other things, that this is loosely inspired by the brain, but it's not really very brain-like. In fact, what we have is this massive statistical associative engine that can be generative and predictive. Um, and it has, in many cases, hundreds of, of layers that we're feeding that activation through, sometimes recurrent layers, um, sometimes feedback swooshes around through the system. Time is an issue. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's critical to read the popular press coverage with an eye towards what's really happening. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask is, when you build one of these things, how could an attacker really screw you up? Like, what are the risks associated with machine learning? And of course, there are many gajillions of different sorts of machine learning architectures when it comes right down to it. So we decided what we would do is get up over the whole problem and talk about a generic machine learning model as kind of our first order of business. And so we came up with this generic machine learning model that has nine components. And the components here are shown in this purple diagram. Processes are ovals, like data set assembly, and collections of stuff, like uh, number three, data sets, training, validation, and test sets are rectangles. And the information uh, flow is represented by arrows. So we have raw data in the world that goes to data set assembly, that goes to these data sets, and then that goes through the learning algorithm and you have the model. So that's kind of what we thought we would do to organize our thinking about risks. We use this model to think about risks in every component. And what I want to share with you today is our results. Uh, I'm going to show you one or two risks associated with each one of these components. So that's 18 two for the whole system. Um, so I'm going to show you 20 risks um, over the course of this talk. And you should realize that the 20 risks I'm going to cover are a subset of the 78 risks we identified um, in this work. You can hear my puppy back there whining. He thinks he wants out because it's getting hot up here. Um, but I'm not going to let him out. So we're, he's just going to have to sit down and go to sleep. All right, so um, here's our machine learning risk analysis. And we'll start with component one which is raw data in the real world. Now, data play a critical role in machine learning systems. In fact, data are a really essential part of any machine learning system. If you think about it, you have this sort of multi-layer thing and the adjustments are made when you put in some input and you get some output and you go, oh, that's wrong. We need to adjust all those weights to make it righter. And you do that millions of times to do all those adjustments. Um, and you can see how the ultimate model is, is really very deeply impacted by the data set that it's trained on. And in fact, data is already a problem in security, as we all know, data security is hard, but it gets even harder when we think about data 
being built into the machine itself through machine learning. Um, in fact, I think about 60% of the risk in, from a security perspective in machine learning um, comes about because of data. So when you go out to find a data set, there's lots of raw data out there to be manipulated. And um, there are ways that attackers can attack this stuff. But you know, let me give you two examples of the 13 risks that we identified with raw data in the real world. The first is data confidentiality. This should be pretty obvious, but if you train up a machine learning system on data that are confidential or that have secrets in them, um, those secrets get embedded directly into, into the machine learning model. And so if you have a ML system that's trained up on confidential or sensitive data, those data are gonna be built in and then attacks to extract that sensitive or confidential information from the ML system, like indirectly through normal use are pretty well known. Um, another way of putting that is if you put the data in there, they're in there somewhere and somebody can probably get them back out. Um, that means if you use machine learning systems for places for subdomains where you know secrecy is super important, like say medical devices or something like that, you have to think two or three times about the kind of data that you're exposing and, and what to do about that. There are some ways to fuzz data and move it around and cleanse data, but really they're not as good as we would like them to be. Um, so that's an example of one of the 78 risks that we've identified. Another example uh, risk is trustworthiness. Data sources aren't always trustworthy or suitable or reliable. In fact, GPT-3, a very, very important natural language processing model put out by OpenAI, um, uses a whole bunch of crap from Reddit to be trained on. So, you know, does that make it suitable? Well, I don't know. Have you ever been on Reddit? Reddit's got some stuff that you don't really want a machine to think about, but the machine is being taught that that's how people think, and so it should think that way too. Uh, so one question to ask if you get over that is, how might an attacker tamper with or otherwise poison raw input data? What happens if input drifts or changes or disappears while we're training, you know, and it's out there in the world or it gets changed, somebody screws around with it. Um, so those are two examples of risks associated with the raw data that we're gonna use. Um, it's not even processed yet. It's just out there in the world. You can't trust everything you find. Um, and these large models don't necessarily throw out the stuff they should throw out. So one of the Next components is assembling that data into something useful. Raw data have to be transformed into a format that the machine learning system can use. And that involves usually a lot of pre-processing. Um, and of course, if you pre-process uh, incorrectly or you screw things up, you can really bias your data. You can screw up your whole machine learning system that way. So the pre-processing step is open to attack. And then there's kind of an issue here that is gonna come up over and over again. This, that is online versus offline models. In an offline model, you train up your machine learning system on all the data and you stop training it. So you decide you're done, you sort of freeze the weights and then you use that model to process new information, but you don't change the weights. You don't do any more learning. In an online situation, you keep on learning even when the model is fielded out there in the world. So it's being used, but it's online and it can be changed. Um, it's still learning. So uh, at the data set assembly uh, do, uh, level, we have to think about um, online versus offline models. So let me give you two examples of the eight risks we found at data set assembly. The first is that the encoding um, that you do, integrity is really, really important. So you can introduce and exacerbate problems in encoding during pre-processing. Does the pre-processing step, step itself introduce security problems? And one of the things you have to think about is bias. Um, so if we have a bunch of raw data and we decide we're just gonna divide it up into males and females as if there are no intersex people or you know white people and black people and those are just absolutes, you know, which is absolutely ridiculous. That's not the way the real world is then you introduce bias by kind of doing that separation and categorization. And if you've done that yourself, your machine learning system, which is just a bunch of statistics, is going to learn all that stuff. There are really important moral and ethical 
implications here. Um, and there's a whole subset of machine learning um, security stuff devoted to bias. Uh, and it's even caused people to get fired from Google and all sorts of controversy and the usual stuff. Um, another example of a risk here is the way that data are tagged and bagged or annotated into features um, can be directly attacked, including you know, introducing attacker bias into a system. Um, so a machine learning system that is trained up on examples that are way too specific won't be able to generalize, for example, or, and, you know, it's often hard to make machine learning systems do what you want them to do. They're very good at slipping out from your constraints. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a well-known model that was supposed to be trained up to discriminate between wolves and dogs. So it got trained up on a bunch of wolf things and a bunch of dog things, mostly pictures. And you give it a new picture and it would say whether it was a wolf or a dog in the new picture. So it's supposed to be a, a wolf dog discriminator. And it worked really well on its training set. It worked well on its, on its uh, test set. Um, but when they put it out there in the world, it started failing spectacularly because it turned out that what they had built wasn't really a wolf detector as much as it was a snow detector. Because it turned out that every single picture of a wolf had a little bit of snow in it. And very quickly, the machine learning model learned to look for snows. Like if there's snow there, it's a wolf. Um, and of course, if you put dog on snow, it would say it's the wolf, and it would be really confident about that. Which goes to show you that you know these things are going to learn stuff you don't really necessarily want them to learn. Um, and a lot of the human engineering that goes into machine learning is spent cleaning and deleting and aggregating and organizing and throw out, just all out manipulating the data so it can be consumed by an ML algorithm. Uh, and that's kind of kludgy, but that's what really happens out there in the world. So that's two examples of risks associated at this component level. The next component we'll talk about is data sets. It turns out that um, data are grouped into training and validation and test sets. Uh, and Figuring out how to partition your data into these sets is really important and it deeply impacts the future behavior of the machine learning system you're building. So if we have a training set, we got to make sure that the training set and the validation set have the same kind of categories and coverage in the world. And we got to make sure that the test set, ultimately, before we decide to release something, it has to pass its little test set actually lines up with the training set and the validation set. And so we're testing the whole range of possibility space and all that stuff is hard. Figuring out how to build those sets, uh, it's pretty pretty much like, well, we sort of do it this way, but there aren't any really um, formal ways to decide that partitioning. So here are some examples of risks in this data set assembly. Number one is poisoning. Um, of all the first three components in our generic model, that is raw data in the world and data set assembly and the data sets themselves, they're all subject to poisoning attacks, whereby an attacker intentionally manipulates data in uh, any of the first three components, possibly in a coordinated fashion, in order to cause the ML training to go off the rails. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. There was a famous ML system called Tay that Microsoft put out. It was supposed to be a little Twitter bot. So Tay was supposed to go out in the world and interact on Twitter and be all cute. And, oh, look, the little ML is on Twitter tweeting away. And of course, as soon as they threw Tay into Twitter, it became a racist, xenophobic, uh, misanthropic troll. <clears throat> kind of the little <clears throat> machine learning asshole, if you will. And it was such a bad, bad actor that Microsoft had to just turn it off. And the reason it became a bad actor is because it was getting all this data about behavior and interacting with users on Twitter that were be trolling it. And it learned to just be a troll. Uh, and so that'll tell you what can happen. It's data were poisoned intentionally by the people that were interacting with it. And it was so bad and it was so public that they had to just turn the thing off. That's one example. Another example has to do with kind of uh, tra data transfer. Um, so in, many ML systems are constructed by tuning an already trained base, base model so that you, know, you have some generic capability like say a circle detector. And then you fine tune that into an oval detector. 
with a round of specialized training. The reason you do this is because it's expensive um, to economically speak, speaking to train up a model, uh, especially a big one. Um, for example, the, the GTP3 model from OpenAI costs $12.5 million to train. Um, and, and people don't just have 12 and a half million bucks laying around to, to train a language model up. Um, so they'll start with GPT-3 and then teach it some subtasks and, and hopefully get it to specialize a little bit, and at least that. Um, now, when you do a transfer like that, of course, all of the risks that are in the, the first model are going to end up in the second model too. So pre-trained model risks carry over. Um, not only that, you can intentionally build a Trojan into a machine learning model, release it to the world, and then people will use that to do their thing. And then you can, you know, tickle the Trojan. And some people call that backdooring in the literature. Unfortunately, it's not really backdooring. It's really Trojan functionality. Um, and so that's two examples of the seven risks we found at this data set le level. Number four is the learning algorithm itself. Of course, this is the technical heart of machine learning. But there's less security risk here than there is in the data that we've already described. Um, once again, though, we have that online versus offline thing. And it should be pretty obvious, prima facie, but offline stuff is way easier to secure than online stuff. Because when it's online, you get something like Tay, where people screw around with it and nudge it to, to do something bad. So an online system that continues to adjust its learning during operations may drift from its intended operational use case to something else. And clever attackers can nudge the thing um, in an online situation in the wrong direction on purpose. And so that's a big risk right there. Uh, uh, example from the real world is um, Google Translate, which had this feedback loop where it was like feeding itself, but it was using its own translations. Like, oh, that's a good example of a translation. And then it would use that to train itself. And it really thought it was great. <laughs> Uh, as it went off the rails. Um, that was unintentional, of course, but there's a reason now that, mission, that Google won't translate its own translations. Um, number two risk is, is reproducibility. And this is kind of like a meta level risk, but it's important. Machine learning work has a tendency to be pretty sloppily reported out there. And results that can't be reproduced may lead to overconfidence or underconfidence in a, in a particular ML system to perform as it's supposed to perform. Um, and if you can't reproduce results in science land, uh, then you got all sorts of trouble. And, you know, if you read some of these um, papers that come out of machine learning, you, you, you find people saying something like, well, we set the learning threshold according to uh, empirical testing, and we set it to four, you know, and you're just like, okay, four. <laughs> why four? Nobody really knows why the the parameters get set the way they do. They just sort of did, and they just sort of kind of worked. Um, and there's a fair amount of work on what's called explainable AI that Joel and I were talking about before this talk started. Um, that's an important aspect of really understanding what you built. Um, and reproducibility plays a role there. So this is two of the 11 risks we, we uh, kind of identified at the learning algorithm component. The next component is um, called uh, evaluation. And the question to ask yourself as a, as a researcher in ML is, well, when am I done with the training? How good is this trained model? And that's what those data sets, validation and test sets are for. Um, so, you know, if you get your validation and test sets wrong, you're not gonna know when you're done or you might think you're done when you're not, um, or you might think your model's better than it really is. So like I told you before, that idea of the validation and test set stuff is pretty darn critical. Um, so here are two examples of the seven risks we sort of tagged at the evaluation level. The number one risk has been around forever and it's called overfitting. So obviously a sufficiently powerful machine is capable of learning its training data set so well that it just essentially builds a big giant lookup table. And so this can be likened to memorizing the training data. Um, and of course, if you do that, you're really good at the training data, but you don't really generalize. So if you don't generalize and you're really good at just parroting out the stuff you got trained on, um, that's called overfitting. And there's always been this kind of, you know, how much fitting is enough fitting? Like how much generalization do we want? Ooh, that's too sloppy. And you want to adjust it to just be exactly right. And nobody can tell you exactly how to do that adjustment. You just have to do it. So that's one example. 
Um, and another example is just plain old bad evaluation data. A bad evaluation data set that doesn't reflect the data that the ML system will ultimately see in production can mislead a researcher into thinking everything's working and everything's fine even when it's not. So evaluation sets can be too small or too similar to the training set or whatever to be useful and give the person training up the ML model the impression that their ML system is better than it really is and then they put it in place and then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So that's two of the seven risks that we identified at evaluation mode. Moving on, the sixth component is inputs themselves. Of course, this is very similar to raw data in the world. You can see there's a, there's a direct line there. So we use the raw data in the world. We, we get it all set up and then we do the learning. And now we have inputs that we're putting into the system. They probably come from the same place out there in the world. So what input is fed into the train model during production? Where does that come from? Who can impact that? Uh, very similar in nature to the data set assembly risks and raw data risks that I've already described for risks from. Um, but this is where we have our first um, piece of terminology that gets thrown around with impunity in machine learning security, and that is adversarial examples. So let's just think about this from a computer security perspective. One of the most important categories of computer security risk is malicious input. And the machine learning version of malicious input has come to be known as adversarial examples. I think the terminology absolutely sucks, by the way. I would rather call it malicious input. But uh, you know, as in all new fields, everybody reinvents the wheel and they call it something else. Imagine if you called wheels, I don't know, flick bloggles, and we'd say, but, but we've had wheels for years. And yeah, but we're calling them flick bloggles. And that's just kind of the way it goes in security. Uh, which is sad, but you know we have to roll with the punches. So adversarial inputs are really important. Um, you can train up a machine learning model, say a visual system on some stuff. And I'll give you an example at University of Michigan, these people trained up a stop sign identifier it's supposed to look at a picture and see the stop sign and say, oh yeah, there's a stop sign. And with the placement of just a little bit of tape on an actual stop sign, you could get this sign recognition email to go, oh, that's not a stop sign, that's a speed limit 45 sign, which is pretty different from stop. Um, and so you can see with just a little bit of tweak to the input, um, because the system's not working the same way our brain works, uh, it's doing something completely different, but it's statistically based, uh, you get these weird surprising things where the little, the little tiniest tweak of the input can sometimes cause catastrophic problems. I'll give you some real examples. I'll show you some pictures of adversarial examples later. One of the issues is, of course, that adversarial examples, because they're, they got high sex appeal, have, have been around for a long time and they sort of appeal to everybody. Um, to, so there's a lot of talk about that. It's an important kind of, kind of risk, but it's not the only one. Uh, another risk here is that uh, what we call controlled input stream, a trained ML system um, that takes its input directly from outside may be purposefully manipulated by an attacker, um, uh, for example, through sensor blinding. You know, imagine you have a, a self-driving car with LiDAR, and so it's using its LiDAR to see, and you just use a laser to blind the LiDAR, and all of a sudden it can't see, and that's controlling the input stream. So um, that's two of five risks we identify at the input level. Then we get to the model itself. So these are risks that are associated with a fielded model, very similar to evaluation risks in many respects. Um, but I'll give you two examples of the five risks we found here. The first is improper reuse. So remember when I said transfer is when you train something up in advance and then you, you do some specific, more specific retraining to get the thing to do something particular. Um, uh, if you reuse uh, a, a system and it has a bunch of risks in it, then, you know, the outside of the intended use, then those, it's gonna not necessarily do what you think that it does. Let me give you an example from the real world. Probably everybody's used their shoe as a hammer. Shoes make really crappy hammers, as you probably found out when you tried to like hit that nail, it didn't really work. Um, and shoes were not designed to be hammers. <laughs> uh, in particular, stilettos make very bad hammers. So, um, you know, the, the, 
the whole idea of well, I'm going to use this model to do that thing, you got to ask yourself, well, did they expect me to do that thing? What's going to happen when I try to do that thing with this thing? And you know, that's a that's that's a risk. So improper reuse. Another risk is I've already alluded to, and that's this Trojan functionality. Model transfer leads to the possibility that what's being reused might be Trojaned or otherwise damaged. Um, and so it might be the wrong thing or might have some, some uh, uh, functionality in it that you don't really expect. Um, so every time it sees a tank, it says cat and you go, everything's fine here, you're just a bunch of cats. And that's not really what's happening. So that's a, those are two of the five risks that we identified at this level. Next comes in the inference algorithm. You know, there are more risks associated with a fielded model. So we've trained the thing up, we've tested it, we thought about the inputs we're gonna, it's gonna get, and we, we know the model, we've frozen it, then we have the whole algorithm and we field that thing. And obviously output risks arise here. So um, a fielded model that's operating in an online system, as we've described before, that's still learning can be pushed past its boundaries as we've already described. Um, and then once again, we've sort of talked about, touched on this, but inscrutability is an issue and way too many systems, an ML system is um, fielded without any real understanding of how it works or why it does what it does. It just sort of does it and it seems to work most of the time and people begin to count on it without really knowing. It's just magic how it does what it does. And if you integrate an ML system that just works into a larger system and then you rely on it, uh, if the ML system fails, the bigger system's gonna fail and it's not gonna be very good at its task or it might be very biased at its task. For example, you might um, train up uh, a machine learning system. This is a real problem on uh, whether or not prisoners are gonna be recidivists and, and you know go out there and do more crime. Uh, and it turns out that all you created with your machine learning system was a black guy detector. And it says, yeah, all the black people, they're gonna go out and do more crime. Then obviously you have a big problem. Um, and if you don't know how your model's doing what it's doing, you didn't realize that it was just a black person detector that you built, um, then you're gonna end up causing some terrible things to happen out there in the world. So those are two cases, uh, two risks of five that we identified at that level. Then finally, we get to our uh, last um, component, and that is where the system output is, you know, happening. And often, obviously, you want some output. That's the whole point. Um, and there are direct attacks on output that are pretty, pretty obvious, like you just do an attacker in the middle. So an attacker tweaks the output stream directly, and this impacts the larger system that the ML is embedded in. There are lots of ways to do this, but the most thing, most common would just be to interpose between the output stream and the receiver. And what makes this worse than usual, than your usual, say, attacker in the middle attack, is that nobody really knows how the ML thing works. So if it starts doing weird stuff, you just go, oh, well, it's just ML. It's just doing slightly weird stuff. Or it's probably right, even though it seems wrong or whatever. You give it sort of the benefit of the doubt much more than you might. Otherwise, it makes it easier to fly under the radar as an attacker. Um, and then number two is you know, provenance. ML systems have to be trustworthy to be put into place. Um, and even a temporary or partial attack against output can cause trustworthiness to plummet. And people will just say, I'm never using ML again. It did all the wrong things and I hate it. I want to throw the whole thing away. Um, and that's, a, that's yet another risk. So there are five more of those in the paper. So what I've covered so far is 18 um, of the 78 risks that we've identified. But there are some more risks that don't really apply to the components. We just did that as an intellectual exercise so that we could think through each component. But we realize that there are some risks that are over the component view, maybe between multiple components or across components. And so uh, we identified 10 risks at this level. And I'll give you two examples. The first is black box discrimination. Um, as I've described, many data related component risks lead to bias um, in the behavior of an ML system. So ML systems that operate on personal data or feed into high impact decision processes like credit scoring or employment or medical diagnosis or recidivism um, pose a great deal of real risk. So when biases are aligned with 
gender or race or age attributes, operating the system with the ML embedded in it may result in discrimination with respect to these, you know, of protected classes. I don't know where that's coming from. Somebody's not on mute. <laughs> I don't know where that's coming from. It's not coming from my machine. So, uh, so this this is a bad thing. We got to think about um, that sort of discrimination. And there are a lot of people that are worried about bias um, in AI, and rightfully so. Uh, and we we really don't know how to deal with that right now. I mean, one of the issues is that we often first turn to historical data to train up a machine learning system. We say, well, I've had a bank since 1850, and you go back and you say, well. You know, women didn't even have rights back then. So we're going to train up a machine learning system to do the same stuff we did when women didn't have rights. Like what? You know. So it's it's a uh, it's important that you think about um, this sort of discrimination and bias that we're building into these systems. Another example is OCOP. So system the particular error behavior because they all have that is integrated into a larger system. But its output is treated as always high confidence. So sometimes the thing goes, a uh, dog, maybe? And we go, oh, it said dog. So it's definitely a dog. Um, users of the system might become overconfident in operating the whole system for its intended purpose. So if you develop overconfidence in an ML system, um, that's bad. And that's easy to do because most people don't really understand how they work and they're only vaguely described and there's a bunch of parameters and blah, blah, blah. So uh, that's, that's a risk. And there are eight more of those um, at the in the in the system, uh, in the paper that we that we uh, described seventy eight risks just like this. So I've told you about twenty. Um, I've sort of gone really quickly through a whole number of risks. And what I wanted to do now is just step back from those and say, look, let's just talk about the top five. Sure, seventy eight, that's great, but let's talk about the top five so you have a take home message here. Um, and, you know, makes it easier to think about. Well, there's obviously a danger of just focusing on the top five. And, you know, the first one will give you a perfect example of that because adversarial examples are what everybody talks about when they talk about machine learning syst uh, systems and, and security. And this is only one of 78 risks. So this is probably the most commonly attacked one. So this is where we fool a machine learning system by providing malicious input often involving pretty small perturbations that cause the system to screw up. Um, and so here's some examples. So on the left, we see a school bus and a grouse and a Mayan temple. And on the right, we see a school bus and a grouse and a Mayan temple. And in the middle, we see this little overlay that we use to change the pixels of the image um, some. So the, the image on the left is the original picture and the image on the right is the pixel with the mask overlaid on it. As a human, you just go still a bus, still a grouse, still a Mayan temple. But a machine learning system says leopard, leopard, leopard. So this goes to show you that those systems don't process visual imagery the way that we do. Um, and that means they're sub su subject to some bizarre statistical uh, attacks like adversarial examples. So there's lots of coverage on this. Uh, resulting in lots of attention, and it's probably disproportionately large, um, swapping out all sorts of other risks. But they're very much real, um, and that's something to understand. So that's risk number one for us of the top five. Number two is data poisoning. I already told you that data play an absolutely outsized role in securing an ML system. So if you can screw around with the data intentionally, you can really screw up an ML system in a coordinated way, and the whole, the whole system that the ML is built into can be compromised. So data poisoning attacks require very special attention. You have to ask what fraction of the training data could an attacker control and to what extent. Um, we're actually working on some training right now um, that makes this clear with real code. So you can have a little system and you can train it up and then you can poison the thing. You can see the poison, train it up again and you see that it does the wrong thing. Uh, and then we do one that's larger where you can't look at the data set and see the poison. And that's really where we are. So you know, I want to build a toy example people can look at. They're going to go, I see how this works. Oh, man, how are we supposed to find the poison in this big giant data set that we just scraped off of Reddit or whatever? Um, so data poisoning is a real thing. Number three, online system manipulation. I've explained this twice so far, so third time's a charm. 
Um, the online system continues to learn during operational use. And so a clever attacker can nudge it in the wrong direction on purpose and retrain the thing to do the wrong thing, just like Microsoft Tray. Hey. Now, the thing that makes this particularly complicated and interesting is that um, ML engineers have to consider a bunch of stuff at once. Where did the data come from? What algorithm did I use? And um, what do I have to do to keep an eye on this thing while it's running and make sure it doesn't drift? So we have three roles that are kind of pretty different in usual security between say security risk analysis and security operations. They all have to be considered to uh, get online manipulation, system manipulation contro under control. The fourth risk in our top five is transfer learning. Um, I've explained that for economic reasons, many ML systems are built by taking an old ML system and you know, fine tuning it to carry out something more specific. Um, this is especially true with the gigantic language models like GTP3. Um, and a data transfer attack takes place when the base system is compromised or otherwise unsuitable. Um, and then you use it and you know, it makes unanticipated behavior happen. And if you're a clever attacker, you can hide that um, behavior in the original system and then it gets transferred right over. Now you guys are going to shake your head as security people, but believe it or not, most of these mo machine learning models that people use are just out there in the world. They're available in open source and they're already trained versions for free and you can just get them and use them. <laughs> and it's kind of like picking up gum off the floor in the men's bathroom. Don't do that. That's bad. Don't do that. Uh, and, you know, they, they haven't even hit on checksums yet. So that's operationally out there. There are a lot of people in machine learning that don't think like security people at all. They just want to get their stuff done uh, and have some fun. Number five is data confidentiality. We sort of started with this and I will emphasize this once again, but data protection is really hard. So imagine you have to protect data when it's sitting still, when it's moving around, you know, at, re at rest, in, in, in motion, when it's being computed. Um, we already think about that from a security perspective and now we throw in machine learning. So one unique challenge in ML is protecting sensitive or confidential data that get crammed into the model through training. They're put right in. Uh, when you think about things like GDPR, here's a question for the European regulators. When I train up something on some GDPR protected data, is that thing protected now? Like is all the ML stuff like GDPR related? I don't know. That's It's uh, something for regulators to fret about um, for the next 25 years. There are subtle, but very effective extraction attacks against machine learning systems data. Uh, and that's a really important category of risk. Uh, and it's a set of attacks that haven't been fully explored yet. So those are the top five of the 78 risks that we identified uh, in our work at BIML. And I'm gonna give you a pointer to where to learn more and then we'll have a few questions. So here is where to learn some more stuff. That's my website right there. And you can get um, all the stuff I talked about today from the BIML website, berryvilleiml.com. And there's my email address and there's my little Twitter handle in case you wanna tweet at me. Uh, and I think Sirius said they'd buy everybody who's at this thing a copy of each of my books. So just ask uh, Joel and he'll give you that book um, for free, right, Joel? I think that was what, what our deal was. So let's take some questions. This, is, this has been fun, but it's been an awful lot of talking to my computer. So I'm feeling a little strange about that. So Gary, I'll start us off. Where are you seeing, um, whether in gov.com, wherever, yeah. that people are getting it right. Yeah. The people that are thinking about this the most, let's just say it that way, <laughs> are at the big companies. So the usual suspects, Google, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, though they all have very active machine learning security groups. And we talk to them at BIML a fair amount. In fact, we're having a little closed session at the end of the week this week um, about that stuff. And I'm gonna give a talk about our results for those guys. Um, and OpenAI and Amazon and, you know, um, those places are the places that you see people making the most progress and thinking about this. 
Now, look, there's a whole bunch of machine learning going on at Google and the machine learning group is finite. So once again, they're all like, wait, God, wow, wait a minute, don't do that, whatever. So they're always kind of playing catch up just like any good security engineering team does in any gigantic corporation. Um, so, you know, part of what I think Bimmel's role is, is to make sure that those kind of security groups that are great um, don't just get used as ass covering, you know, maneuvers by the giant corporations. And so that's kind of what uh, I think our role at Bimmel is about. Does that answer so your For question? the attendees, if you've got questions, please uh, type them into the uh, Q&A section and we'll get them addressed. Yeah, let me stop sharing my screen real quick. Blink, I can see you. Yeah, feel free to ask. And I, I put in the chat uh, a copy of the URL to the paper that we put out. Um, so you can snag a copy uh, if you want. Uh, ask you to register, there's sort of a registration wall, but you can just lie to the registration thing. Just tell it your Bill Gates like everybody else does. I'm not asking myself a question. <laughs> Don't be shy. Ah, hey, I see Tim Grants ask, what would you like NIST to do? Um, I think that NIST has been gathering a lot of information about attacks and they try to build an taxonomy that seemed to me more like a big giant collection. Um, and so I think what NIST can do that would be very helpful is to make sure that we don't just fall down into the attack of the day hole um, and worry about only adversarial input, for example. Um, but we get past attacks and we start thinking about systematic risks um, of the sorts that we're identifying at, at, uh, at BIML. Um, and that's a, that's a hard thing um, to, to do. Like, you know, figuring out how to do that, I don't know how to do that. Um, so I'm glad you guys at NIST are, are, are paying attention to this problem. Um, I don't think we have the answer of where we all want to be directed yet. But I do think that making sure that the big companies don't just go, oh, well, if we all just do this really easy task for, then everything will be taken care of. And don't fall for that. I mean, you, I'm pretty sure you won't, but watch out for that. Thanks, Tim. Glad you're here. Who else yes, has well, it? nice to see your uh, your name come up in there, Tim. So Gary, <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 I read an article, oh, it was probably six months ago, but it was industry specific, uh, I uh, quite honestly, I thought a bit of it was naive, but but it did was a nice uh, conversation starter here. So uh, ML applied to the uh, automotive industry, uh, especially yeah. in like some of these uh, autonomous vehicles. I guess mm -hmm. it'd be more than just automotive, but any of these autonomous vehicles. Any just general thoughts of where they're going right or wrong? Well, I mean, look, these systems work really pretty well until they don't, and then they fail, and they fail in surprising ways. So if the surprising ways involve killing humans, that's bad. <laughs> and if you look at what's happened recently with the autopilot systems and the self-driving cars and the crashes, and you know, there's a whole slurry of them just from last week, um, that's bad. So uh, I guess you got to count on the humans to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. So part of the design should be uh, the ML system works great when the humans are working great and paying attention. The ML system also needs to do something smart when the humans do the dumb thing. Like if a human tries to do a really dumb thing uh, with autopilot, the autopilot just could say, no, I'm not playing along with that. Forget it. I'm not going to drive. This is a dumb time to drive. Go park <laughs> or something like I'm that. The, I'm the father of a uh, uh, engineer who works at one of the, the big three automotive industry, uh, automotive manufacturers. And I know that, uh, He's been somewhat involved with that, and 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 I can tell you that that even from his perspective, they recognize that, and they're not taking it lightly. So it's it's oh I know certainly coming. It's certainly coming. I think oh I know, and it, it, it's not like self driving stuff is is exactly new. I mean, I was in a self driving Hummer at CMU in 1993, really, and it, it had to be a Hummer because it had to carry around its generator to run all the spark stations to do the analysis, but it was using deep learning to drive itself around and it did a pretty good job. So Tim's asking another question. And since Tim is the only guy asking questions, we'll answer them. He says, uh, is a trustworthy AI framework feasible? 
that can reconcile fairness and explainability and trustworthiness all together. Um, it's probably exactly the same amount feasible as it is for all software. So, you know, the, the answer is your mileage may vary. But even having a framework at all where you say, look, the, this sort of stuff is important. And if you don't think about this at all, if we come to you and we go, is your ML system biased? And you go, what's that mean? We know that you're that you haven't thought about this properly. That's even helpful. Um, so right now, in the kind of wild west of everybody's adopting ML because it's the hot new, um, we can really benefit from a framework because of that. Now we're getting a little a bunch of stuff. So shall I just do these in order, Joel? Um, yeah, go right Donnie ahead. Went, Donnie Wynn says, most companies implement vendor products that they claim use magic ML fairy dust. I love it. That sounds like the magic crypto fairy dust that I've talked about for 20 years. How can these companies determine how vulnerable these products are? That's a really good question. I don't think many people are providing services around that stuff. I know of a few tiny little startups that are doing kind of machine learning, security, and risk assessment type work, but they're all very tiny. They're all like three guys in the dog. Um, so I'm not sure who I would turn to commercially um, to determine how, how full of baloney those, those products are. But one good general rule of thumb is if it's a startup and they're saying, we use ML to do the magic thing, you can just put on your bullshit detector and go, oh, must be bullshit. <laughs> so 90%, probably not. Um, an anonymous attendee, I like that. Are you also looking into the security of systems running the models? e.g. how to lock down the API interfaces, sanitize inputs, rate limit, and so on? That's an excellent question. Uh, the answer is yes. And one of the things we're trying to do now uh, at Bimmel is we're taking some technology from Run Safe Security and we're using that to rewrite some open source stuff from PyTorch so that we have a protected version of that where memory attacks are way harder to do. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of things that you can do like that at runtime um, guidance on system deployment is going to, you know, matter. It sort of matters what it is you're doing with ML, but you shouldn't just assume that the ML is always going to do the right thing. Um, and so I think the the main piece of advice is assume it's going to screw up, uh, and it'll screw up in an unanticipated way. So maybe give it some some guide rails, and when it gets outside the guide rails, have a plan. What are you going to do? Are you just going to like crash the car? Are you just going to like you know, not give anybody loans, you're going to give everybody loans, how are you going to fail? So, so uh, knowing that is, is kind of what you have to do. So that's the answer to that one. Tim Shamil asks, um, given that machine learning is being applied to analysis of network traffic data, what big risks should we be looking for? And since I'm not a network uh, traffic data guy, the answer is beats me, man, I don't know. Uh, maybe we should all look for the evil bit. We can ask uh, Steve Bellavin, if we can get the, the fact on the evil bit and then we can just set up ML to look for the evil bit. I don't know. Good question, not a network guy. Uh, Donnie Went asks, what's the name of the dog? The name of the dog who's over there right now sleeping on the couch because this is his like maybe 10th version of this talk he's had to suffer food through and it's kind of hot because I have the AC off up here so you guys can hear me. Um, the name of the dog is Moonshine. And Moonshine is only four months old. And, you know, so he's not even halfway grown. He's going to be a gigantic dog, but boy, is he good. I've raised about 10 puppies and he's the best one so far. Finally, Tim Grants gets to ask the very last question, I think, because we're done with our time. Um, and Tim should get to ask three questions because he's being very proactive. So he says, do we overemphasize models and endless tweaks over good data? Um, and P.S. Your dog is bored. I know the dog is bored. You really would rather have a treat. Um, yes, I think we do overemphasize models and endless tweaks on models over good data. But the problem is that if you look at the data work, say the stuff that was pr it's produced by IBM, they have this whole ML data cleansing set, look for bias or whatever. They provide like 150 little ways to look for stuff in your data, but they don't give you any guidance about how to apply those tools. So there's no magic solution to, if you just run your data through that sieve, everything will come out fine on the other end. We don't really know. Um, there are some people that are working hard on that problem, 
uh, but we've not solved that one yet. So another good question from Tim. Tim, it is super great to see NIST psyched about ML. So thank you so much for asking good questions and paying attention here. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Joel. Thanks to you all for having me here. I really appreciated the opportunity to tell you what we're doing at BIML. That was fun. Gary, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Can't wait for your talk from 2031. <laughs> um, I'm not sure we have that topic yet, but uh, let me know when you're ready to, to identify that topic. Thanks to all the attendees who tuned in to the very first uh, serious security seminar of the 2021 summer. Uh, we will be back next week at 1.30 Eastern. Uh, note, there are a couple of people ask questions of where they could find a cop, a recording of this, uh, of this talk in a few days time. Uh, that will appear at the Sirius website. Uh, I've got an address in the chat box, but you can also just do a uh, internet search for the Sirius website and you'll find it there. And everything is also posted for the last uh, few couple years, few years uh, at our YouTube channel. By the way, hey, is, my, is my 2001 pick talk? Your 2001 is on the Sirius website. It, uh, no, everything... actually that one is not because it, uh, you know, I'm checking to see if we have it on videotape and to get it digitized. So get it digitized. Um, I'd yeah. love to see what it sounded like 20 right. years ago. That'd be good. That. But I would say in 10 years, I hope that your talk will be about uh, how to deal with our computer robot overlords. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the puppet meat puppet me will be speaking. <laughs> Thanks, so guys. Again, really uh, tune in, uh, tune in next week for our next talk and throughout the summer, uh, again, 1.30 uh, Eastern time uh, and take a look online at some of our past talks. Uh, as Mike said, Gary's might actually show up there, but um, <laughs> Tim, uh, but uh, it reads like a who's who in the cybersecurity industry and you take a look at 20 plus years worth of talk. So with that, we're done for the week. Gary, again, thanks very much. Always great to have you on campus, whether it's virtual or in person. And with Can't that- Can't wait to do it in person, guys. Everybody get vaccinated, just do it. All and right. with that, we are done for the day. Thanks everybody. Thanks Bye. Gary, take care.